Earth. Behold its magnificence. But wait, what you see around you is not the full story. As a land dweller, it's natural for you to focus on the mountains, valleys, fields, flora and fauna that characterize our world. But land makes up just a fraction of the planet's surface. More than 70% of the world is covered in water, prompting some to quip that a more appropriate name for Earth would be ocean. We can't see very far beneath all this watery stuff, but when we use sophisticated technology to dive into its pelagic depths, we are frequently astounded by what we find. I'm Seth Shostak. Molly Bentley is at the ocean, and we'll hear from her shortly. Welcome to Big Picture Science, produced at the SETI Institute, where researchers investigate the nature and origin of life. On Big Picture Science, we step back to get the wide-angle view on science and technology. And in this episode, we go wide and deep to reveal the marvels and the menace of the sea. From the panoply of life that resides there, most of it still undiscovered, to the tectonic forces that shape the seabed and the rest of the planet. And not all of these are benign. The ocean floor has the potential to release seismic energy that could devastate our coasts. It's what lies beneath. There is life up and down this beach. There are seagulls, other birds like terns, there are some crabs humans, there's a dog. If you want to meet the rest of the living creatures, out there is where you want to be. The ocean is the largest living space on Earth. The average depth is about 4,000 meters, well over two miles. And it's filled with life, which makes it the largest repository of life on Earth. Although biologist Bruce Robeson is one of the few who have plunged to its watery depths, Dr. Robeson of the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute has used submersible robots to explore some of it. Diving into the deep ocean with a, with a submersible is certainly the most exciting thing I've ever done. It's exciting because there's always something new. It's a physical challenge because you're running the, the vehicle and trying to make sure that everything goes safely and well. And it's also intellectually challenging because you're trying to figure out what it all means. What are these various parts? How do they hang together into a functional system? And what the heck is that animal? And it is in the deep ocean that biologists made a discovery about life on this planet that forced one recalculation of the distribution of animals. Now, if you place your hand at the back of your neck, you'll feel the bone that runs down to your rear. The spine is something that you share with many other animals. You are a vertebrate. Now, recently, the most numerous vertebrate on the planet was thought to be the chicken. These domesticated seed eaters are thought to number 24 billion. That's more than three times the number of people on Earth. But the chicken's days of wearing the crown of the most populous vertebrate seem to be over. The new title goes to an animal that lives beneath those waves. And this discovery surprised biologists. A fish called the bristlemouth may be the most numerous vertebrate on Earth. The bristlemouth fish is nondescript in some respects in that it has uh, some distinguishing characteristics, a small eye, a big head, but they impress one who meets them with their numbers. They are vast. Certainly everywhere I've explored the deep sea, we run into bristlemouth fishes or the genus Cyclothony as we call them. The numbers used to describe bristlemouth are usually reserved for astronomy. Trillions or quadrillions, could the numbers really be that high? It's certainly possible that the numbers could be that high. I'm not brave enough to put a, an actual number on what their population might be globally, but I'm certain that the assessment is correct that they are the most abundant vertebrate animals on the planet. How do they capture their prey when they're at deep in the ocean and there's very little if no light at all? What do they use to find what to eat? Good question, and the kind that we ask ourselves. We suspect that the bristlemouth is tuned into the water around it 
very acutely by the organs along its side that are sensitive to vibration, low frequency vibration created by movement in the water around it. So if the bristle mouth senses the presence of a, a small crustacean, a, a little shrimp or a copepod nearby, um, it probably takes advantage of the fact that it has a huge mouth and that by snapping that large mouth open, it creates suction and, and pulls in the, the prey. Lots of fish feed that way, and it certainly makes sense that given the anatomical structure we see in the bristle mouth, that that's the way they do as well. Now, the bristle mouth is translucent. Is that a particular adaptive strategy for an animal in the deep ocean? Is that where you would find that physical characteristic most often? A translucent body is very useful for animals that live in the mesopelagic or what's called the twilight zone where there is still just a little bit of, of sunlight uh, available during the day. It's a camouflage of sort and makes them hard to detect. Now there's another adaptive strategy I understand that it employs that also uses light and it's a form of bioluminescence, a phenomena called counter illumination which sounds like a lamp that is sitting somewhere in a <laughs> cafe but I don't think that's what this is, right? What is counter illumination? Counter illumination in this case is the use of light to camouflage your body in, in the deep ocean. Many of the predators uh, including the, the predators of bristle mouths, find their prey by gazing upwards and trying to see the silhouette or the shadow of the animal by looking at it from below and detecting the shadow against the lighted waters uh, above. So the bristle mouth and indeed many species of fishes and, and some squids try to erase their shadows by using light that they produce themselves in organs along their bellies that can exactly match the intensity and the wavelength of the light that's, that's downwelling around them. So in essence, they are able to eliminate or erase their, their shadow and thus to outwit, or maybe not outwit, but to fool a predator that's trying to look upward from below and spot that shadow. So the invisible man has nothing on these guys? Not a bit. So it gives us an idea that there's an abundance of life in the deep ocean, weird, weird not to it, but maybe to us, maybe not to you, alien life there, and so much we still have to study. We don't know a lot about it. The animals that live in the deep ocean do indeed appear weird or alien to us, but they're perfectly adapted to the habitat that they live in, and so from their perspective, they're perfectly natural. and. One of the most exciting things about deep sea exploration is that we're continually finding new things. We've been working here in Monterey Bay for more than 20 years, diving in deep water on a regular basis, and we're still finding new things. That huge biomass of, of life that lives in the ocean, which far outstrips the biomass of, of terrestrial life, must contain an unbelievable number of uh, undiscovered, exciting new creatures. Not the kind maybe that, that we would ordinarily expect. Um, as it turns out, gelatinous animals in many cases dominate that, that whole landscape. Maybe that's not the right word. The whole seascape. But <laughs> when we account for them, we are even more impressed by how much life is down there. You have described yourself in writing and, and earlier when we were talking as growing up as a beach kid, but the beach is still technically land and there's a difference between being a beach kid and being a deep sea scientist. And you've been down many times now and I wonder if you can remember what it was like to leave the beach and plunge into the ocean for the first time to some considerable depth. The beach provides access to the ocean and, and that's always been my perspective. The beach is where you went when you wanted to get in the ocean and as a kid I, I swam and scuba dived and, and surfed and the beach was access but going further out which to me has always been very alluring, very 
compelling. Come further, come deeper. Uh, we terrestrial beings live in a three-dimensional world, but in reality, it's two-dimensional because gravity ties us to the floor or, or the ground or the set of stairs that we use to move in the vertical plane. In the ocean, however, it's a truly three-dimensional realm because if you have neutral buoyancy, or even if you don't, if you have some power to move, then you can move in any direction uh, at any time. And that changes everything in terms of how animals interact with each other, how community structure is put together, how the whole ecosystem functions. Do you remember the first time that you took a dive? And was it exciting? It must have been also a little scary. I was so excited there wasn't time to be scared. <laughs> My first submersible dive was in Alvin, the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution's human-occupied vehicle, and it was in the Atlantic Ocean. I think the first sensation that came to me was, holy cow, this is really different than what I expected. Part of it was that three-dimensionality. Part of it was there were so many different kinds of animals than I could collect with, with my nets, and indeed, one of the most common phrases on our, our video dive tapes, the, the audio track of our video dive tapes is, what the heck is that? Because we run across strange, unexpected things very frequently. I was looking at one of the tapes from one of your dives and there was this incredible orange, an orange was the color, an orange, jellyfish with many i'm guessing it was a jellyfish many tentacles and sort of a, a decorative fringe around what could be described only as a hat but that was the body of the jellyfish and just an exquisite animal it really took my breath away so many of those creatures are unspeakably beautiful uh, we we lack the words to adequately describe them their shape and configuration and the uh, and the, the kinds of structures that are apparent in the, in the bodies of transparent animals. One reason we, that we're struck by the, the color patterns is how bright they are. Why reds? Why orange? Um, that doesn't make sense. Well, until you think about it and talk to some physicists, it turns out that when white light strikes the surface of the ocean, white light from the sun, the first wavelengths that are absorbed are in the red range. Blue wavelengths of light travel the farthest. And so in deep water, only blue light is available. And uh, if you were wearing a red shirt and only blue light was available to look at it, the red pigment in your shirt would absorb all of the, all of the light and reflect nothing back. So in essence, the shirt would appear black rather than red. In deep water, that's very much a useful tool because the surroundings are black. So a red object absorbs all of the wavelengths of red that are available, and the blue doesn't reflect back from that pigment. And so the animal is, in essence, invisible. And finally, given an idea of what's in the ocean and what's not in the ocean, but that we know that there's great biodiversity there. Can you imagine that on an ocean on another planet, another moon, such as Europa, which has an ocean underneath its icy crust, could there also be a population of as rich, perhaps, as that which we have on Earth? I sure hope so. One of the things that you learn to appreciate about life itself is that it is persistent and it invades every possible living space. Uh, even things that seem so harsh to us as to be unimaginable as, as places to live in hydrothermal vents where the, the heat is, is so intense or in high altitudes or in crushing pressures and intense cold. Some form of life always seems to make it. So if the life that we see on Earth is any indication, then 
my guess is that there's a good chance that we'll find some form of life uh, in any ocean we encounter off this planet. Bruce Robeson, thank you so much for joining me out here on the seawall to talk about the ocean. Sure, glad to. It's a really exciting prospect for anybody who stares and looks out across the surface and then imagines, I wonder what's down below. Bruce Robeson is a deep sea biologist at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. You know, Seth, I didn't get the chance to see a bristlemouth, but they're sort of ferocious looking fish. They resemble maybe a barracuda with their big mouth and their underbite, uh, but they're only three inches long. Oh, so not that terrifying, perhaps. Well, they're terrifying to their prey, but you're right, probably not to you. The thing that struck me about them is the fact that they can do this counter-illumination. They can make their bellies glow so you can't see them up against the bright surface of the sea. I mean, this is Harry Potter's invisibility cloak. It's true. It's incredible the adaptive abilities that these animals have there at the, the deep sea. Now, while Dr. Robeson prefers to work in the ocean. He also works in a sea lab to study some of these animals. Not all of them he can bring up from the deep sea. The bristlemouth, for example, is very hard to catch, and it might not survive the trip. But they do have a, a lab where they study other animals, vampire squid and deep sea urchins and jellyfish and so forth, to understand basic biology, but also how changing ocean conditions might affect these animals. Yeah, well, I can imagine as the oceans warm, of course, that's going to drive the gas, and in particular, oxygen out of the oceans, just the same way you warm up a soda, all the fizz comes out. That can be bad. Bruce Robinson gave me a quick look at this mini ocean away from the ocean. This is our seawater lab, where we have seawater directly from Monterey Bay that we chill down to the temperatures that approximate or actually duplicate those in the deep sea. We can control the temperature and other aspects of the seawater, how much oxygen is in it, how much acidity it offers, the salinity and things like that. And are the animals behind those doors that look like some kind of refrigerator? We have three cold rooms, and indeed many of the animals that we're working on are in those environmental chambers in order to, to closely monitor things like their respiration, behavior. It sounds as though some of your questions have to do with the basic biology of these animals, but they also sound pertinent to studying the effects of climate change. Absolutely. And indeed, the principal focus of our major research effort now is trying to understand the consequences of declining oxygen concentration in the ocean. And if what we've learned so far turns out to be statistically valid, then What's taking place in the ocean is that animals are moving out of their traditional habitats. And we're seeing a realignment, reorganization, and ecological changes that are going to have profound consequences. The ocean tantalizes us with its many murky mysteries. Even our knowledge of its topography is often fuzzy. So. Lo and behold, another discovery in the deeps, like the high number of bristlemouth, which also demands a superlative, the largest geologic structure on Earth. It's What Lies Beneath on Big Picture Science. Some scientists, like Bruce Robeson, much prefer a day at sea to one seated in an office. He and other scientists have found ways to turn this wish into reality. Hi there, my name is William Sager. People call me Will. I am a professor of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences at the University of Houston, and my job is a really cool job. I explore the oceans with sound and geophysics, and I study deep sea volcanoes, among other things. Imagine walking two miles from your home, more or less the way a crow flies. It'll probably take you almost an hour, and you'll end up in someone else's neighborhood. Now imagine traveling that distance, two miles, down into the ocean. That is where the deep volcanoes that Will Sager refers to reside. And that is his laboratory. Volcanoes that rise from the seafloor are thought to be caused by the movement of tectonic plates. As the plates drift apart, 
Plumes of magma surging from within Earth's hot interior pour through the gap. We say our thought to because there's still a lot we don't know about the ocean. Just as our catalog of biology that resides there is incomplete, so is our map of the deep ocean's physical structure. So surprises should come as no surprise. Up until a couple years ago, an oceanic plateau southeast of Japan called the Shatsky Rise was thought by scientists to be just that, a plateau of ancient lava created by a series of volcanoes. But recently, Dr. Sager, who has studied this geologic structure for years, took a closer look. His team analyzed core samples taken from the plateau and compared them with seismic reflection data. Now, those are data collected on a ship when scientists deliberately produce some acoustic waves. The waves bounce over whatever lies beneath and reflect back to the ship where their amplitudes and delays are used to interpret the structure of the plateau. Frankly, this is just like sonar, but in the service of geology. And what Will Sager found is that what was thought to be a series of mountain ranges was revealed to be one single massive volcano. It is called Tamu Massif. This undersea volcano has snatched the crown of biggest volcano from Mauna Loa in Hawaii. Now, Mauna Loa's size is approximately 2,000 square miles or 5,200 square kilometers. Tamu Massif is roughly 120,000 square miles or 312,000 square kilometers. It is the size of Poland or the state of New Mexico. Are there any bigger volcanoes around? Yes, but not in our neighborhood. You need to look skyward to Olympus Mons on Mars. Will, maybe you could describe what a, a, a massif is underwater there. I mean, is it just a big rise of land? Is it, should I think of it as like a mesa in the American Southwest, except maybe larger? Yeah, that's a pretty good visual. We uh, purloined a French geological term. Massif means an isolated mountain range, basically. But Tamu, I mean, that sounds like a Polynesian god, but I, I take it it's not. <laughs> no. So when we went out there 20-some years ago to do our first surveys, we needed names for the things. I was at the time at Texas A.M. University, and that's T-A-M-U. <laughs> okay. So this is an underwater volcano then. I mean, is it erupting now? Is it doing its volcanic thing, or is it just sitting there kind of quiescent? Oh no, this thing is good and dead, and that, and we should be happy about that because this type of volcano, as far as we know, hasn't happened in the last 50, 60 million years. But at a time during Cretaceous, about 120 million years ago, as a bunch of these went off, they may have affected climate. So this outpouring of lava that would have formed this big volcano would be a, a bad thing to have happen. It really might be climate change on a global scale. So as far as we know, it was active about 145 million years ago, and since then it has moved away by plate tectonics a long way from where it, uh, it originated. Now, you used a research vessel to explore Tamu Massif. Maybe you can describe that vehicle. I mean, is it something that you get into and actually go underwater? Well, no, it's not that much fun. I'm a geophysicist, which means I use remote sensing to look at the bottom of the ocean and what's beneath the bottom of the ocean. So I don't get a chance to go into research submersibles very often. One day I'll tell you the story. I actually did do that once in the Gulf of Mexico and discovered a deep sea squid that nobody had seen before. And so I'm probably more famous for that than anything. And I don't know anything about deep sea squid. But anyway, so uh, we used two special uh, ships for this. One was called the Integrated, well, it used to be Integrated Ocean Drilling Program, now called the uh, International Ocean Discovery Program. It's a deep sea drilling ship. We actually drilled pieces of rock from this. So we knew that there were massive lava flows that came out of it. And then we took another ship that used seismic techniques, the same techniques that the oil industry uses to look deep uh, within the earth to find oil. We used it, there's no oil out there. We used it to shoot sound waves deep within this volcano to see the layering. So we could see not only was it a single volcano and the lava flows all seemed to come from the center, but also we had pieces of those lava flows to know that there were massive, very thick lava flows. You know, I'm, I'm picturing something that's kind of conical and has caldera's kind of a scooped out section in the center. Would I see any of that if I saw underwater photos of this thing? Well, that's a good picture of what to expect, but you're not going to see it because ask any submarine commander. If you want to find a really good place to hide, 
go underwater. We can't use electromagnetic waves to penetrate very far within the ocean. So you could go down to the bottom and you could look around, but you would have a hard time telling what you were sitting on top of. If we could take away the whole ocean and photograph it from a satellite, then we would see it just like Olympus Mons, the solar system's largest volcano on Mars. Then we could see what it's like, but we really couldn't see it because it's all covered by the, by the ocean. So Olympus Mons, it's this big volcano on Mars. It's extinct, but it's three times as high as Mount Everest. So Tamu Masif, I mean, judging by the name, I figure it's big. Is it in the Guinness Book of Records? Is it the biggest? Well, I don't know of any Guinness Book of World Records for scientific claims like that. And it's actually kind of a funny story because I never, I would have always told my students, don't ever say something like that because you're just going to get other scientists mad and try to prove you wrong. But in order to get it published in the a top journal, they basically said, the editor said, well, okay, it's a big volcano, so what? And I said, well, as far as I know, it's the biggest volcano in the world. And so that became the, the tagline to get interest in the, in the press. And actually it was great because it it's, was one of those things that make people look up from their smartphone for a few seconds and say, oh, what's that? <laughs> uh, so, I mean, that was really nice. So it is very big. I made a plot that shows the shape of it next to the shape of Olympus Mons, and they're very similar size. Now, the big difference is Olympus Mons sticks up about 22 kilometers, but this one is only about three kilometers high. So people say, oh, it's kind of a pipsqueak then. No, it's like an iceberg. It formed on lithosphere, the outer uh, rigid layer of the earth that was very thin, and so it yielded, sort of like putting weights on a, on a waterbed. It just sunk in. Olympus Mons formed on the very thick lithosphere, so it's sort of like pouring concrete on a uh, on a board. You know, it just built up. So the two are not that far off in size, and this thing is 50 times larger than Mauna Loa, which is the largest active volcano. I would think that the Hawaiians might be upset. I mean, they had the biggest volcano on Earth up until, well, this. Well, they still have the biggest active volcano in the world, and it's a drive-in volcano, and I highly recommend that you go take a look at it. Okay. All right. Maybe you could give me some idea of the scenario for the formation of this volcano. Now, we're talking about something that happened when there were dinosaurs on the Earth, right? How, how did uh, Tambu Massif make the scene? What happened? Well, that's really the central question. We, we're not allowed, well, we're, we're not funded to go out and discover things. Nobody says, oh, here's a grant, go discover something. The grant was all based around how do we get these massive volcanoes forming in the oceans. And at the time, we didn't know Tamu Massif was a single volcano. It was a volcanic mountain range, a huge volcanic mountain range. So how did this thing come from? There are two leading schools of thought. The main one is that you have a big blob of hot material from deep within the earth, a so-called mantle plume that rises up. And when it comes to the Earth's surface, it causes a massive eruption. Another one is that, oh no, you don't need all that. You just crack the Earth's surface basically in the right spot and it, you get this runaway melting and it forms a big volcano. And so we are trying to, with a series of studies, try to understand how that might happen. Now you've mentioned that it's uh, hard to get good pictures of this because it's all underwater. And it's uh, about the size of New Mexico. <laughs> okay, you might, you need a really wide angle lens there. Okay, so um, how deep is it? I mean, we're talking about, you know, things at depth here. This, this is not just below the surface and, and was it always underwater? Well, that's also a really good question. Well, today there's a little peak that sticks up about to about two kilometers depth. Sorry, I'm calibrated for kilometers under the ocean. So uh, maybe a mile and a half, something like that. Uh, and then the main top of it was pro is down about three kilometers. So uh, a couple of miles. And so the, if you could take away the ocean, you could fly over it like in an airplane, you, you could definitely see it, but it would still be like flying over the state of New Mexico. It's that big. And the slope is very, very shallow. So if you were standing on it, you'd have a difficult time telling which way is down. It's only a, only about a slope of about, uh, about one degree. So that's the real challenge is it's both very big and it's also covered with water. And the other real challenge is that we've only, it's in the middle of the ocean, which is very, very hard to get to. So we've only, we ran a few lines with our seismic system. It's sort of like studying New Mexico by going along the major interstates and saying, oh yeah, I know how New Mexico came around. 
you say that it's uh, three kilometers down. Now, I, right. I don't know much about diving. I don't do diving myself, except with a snorkel. And I, I can't imagine a three-kilometer-long snorkel. Uh, can can nope. you? Can yeah. you, no, would, you wouldn't want to do that. No, I suppose not. I mean, it would be her, kind of inconvenient to carry around, if nothing else. But can, can humans get down to three kilometers depth with the right kind of aqua lung, or is that completely out of the question? Oh, that's completely out of the question. You... At that depth, the pressure is crushing. You need to uh, have a research submersible. With a, you typically, they have a titanium sphere that allows it to keep the pressure from crushing it. No, with uh, divers can only go down a few hundred feet, even even the most highly trained one with the best equipment. Well, why does this discovery matter to you? Does it change our understanding of how tectonics works? Well, sure. That's That's the reason for me to study it. So let's say that I discovered a new T-Rex that was 50 times larger than the other T-Rex that we knew about. That would probably make paleontologists rethink everything they know about how dinosaurs came around. And so it's the same thing with this big volcano. It's much bigger than any other volcano, single volcano that we knew about. And so now if you're a volcanologist, you have to put this into your worldview is that we can have eruptions that seem to come from a single source that can form volcanoes that are the size of large states. So that's much bigger than most volcanoes we know about. If this kind of a volcano had formed, say, uh, in North America, I mean, <laughs> that would be the, the biggest thing about North America, perhaps. Well, right. I mean, it would be it would be huge, and you would see it from space, and we would know all about it, and it would be part of part of our knowledge. But because it's hidden under the ocean, we don't know it. Well, finally, Will, uh, it's often said that we have better maps of the moon or of Mars than of our ocean seafloor. Is that still true? And does this this uh, revelation of the true nature of Tamu Massif change any of that? Well, that's a, that's a good question because I sometimes say that exact same thing, especially when I'm trying to tell people how little we really know about the oceans. It turns out that NASA and some other sp- I think the European Space Agency have sent out satellites that actually map the surface of the ocean, and from that they can infer the depth of the ocean. It's kind of complicated, but it's looking at the gravitational effect. And so in a way we know about what's out in the ocean, but it's sort of like a shadow. We know the shape without knowing what it is. And so that was the big thing here was that we didn't know what it is. And so we still have a lot of that to learn. And you go out to places in the ocean and you look and there are areas that are the size of at least small states, hundreds of kilometers where there are no scientific ship tracks. And so basically there's no actual direct data from the ocean floor. So yes, we still have a lot to learn about the bottom of the ocean. Sounds to me like you have job security there. Will uh, yeah. <laughs> Will Sager, thank you so very much for being with us today. Oh, well, thanks very much for having me. William Sager is a marine geophysicist in Earth and Atmospheric Sciences at the University of Houston. You can take a marine geologist out of the water, but not for very long. A final thought from Dr. Sager. We're going back to Tamu Massif again this fall. I've got a cruise on the research ship Falcor, and we're going to be collecting both bathymetry, that's ocean depth, and magnetic field data over Tamu Massif to try to figure out better exactly how it formed. And the best thing is that we're gonna be online. If you Google Schmidt Ocean Institute, you're gonna be able to tune in and see what we're doing. So you can travel remotely to the bottom of the sea with Dr. Sager and his team in the fall of 2015. We'll have a link to Schmidt Ocean Institute on our website. Will Sager says that Tamu Massif is an extinct volcano, and we should be happy about that. Well, honestly, we are. I mean, just check our smiles. But the entire ocean floor is hardly this reassuringly quiescent. Powerful tectonic forces are grinding away right now and creating some very active fault lines. Up next, why the Cascadia Fault Zone in the Pacific has seismologists and coastal residents concerned. Its unleashing of a mega earthquake and tsunami is a scenario of not if, but when. It's what lies beneath on Big Picture Science.
The volcano Tamu Massif was created by tectonic activity. More specifically, it's thought to be the result of seafloor spreading. But tectonic plates don't just drift apart, they also slam together. The enormous Japanese Tohoku earthquake in 2011 originated in a subduction zone, where one plate is driven under another. In this case, the Pacific plate dives under the North American plate upon which Japan sits. And yes, you heard that right. Japan is partly situated on the North American plate. The result in March that year was a devastating and extremely rare magnitude 9 earthquake. But it was the tsunami that followed that caused the meltdown of the Fukushima nuclear power plant. All told, more than 15,000 people died in the combined disasters, and hundreds of thousands were forced to evacuate their homes. An article in the July 2015 issue of the New Yorker magazine described the devastation of the Tohoku quake and the experience of a marine geologist and geophysicist, Chris Goldfinger, who was in Japan at the time, attending an international meeting on seismology. The New Yorker article quickly went viral, urgently posted and forwarded an email and on social media. And this is because Dr. Goldfinger's area of expertise at the University of Oregon is another subduction zone in the Pacific Ocean that could potentially release as much energy as the Japanese quake with consequences for the North American coast. Dr. Goldfinger studies a plate boundary that stretches from northern Vancouver along the coastlines of Washington and Oregon down to Northern California. It's called the Cascadia Subduction Zone. It's not as well known as the San Andreas Fault or even the Japanese Subduction Zone, although that may have changed with the New Yorker article. This collision at the Cascadia Fault, where the Juan de Fuco plate ducks under the North American plate, well, that's usually fairly quiet. The occasional small quakes there don't rattle the residents of the Pacific Northwest. The potential for a large one, however, does. Dr. Goldfinger and other scientists estimate that the Cascadia Fault Zone has built up enough stress to produce a magnitude 9 earthquake, and as with Tohoku, create a massive tsunami. The discovery of this danger was the result of some clever scientific work. Chris, I wonder if you could take us deep into the Pacific Ocean to the Cascadia Subduction Zone. Give us a description. Now, if we were able to go down there, where would we go and what would we see if we could also speed up time? What would we see occurring? <laughs> well, so you'd be about 60 to 100 miles offshore in about 3,000 meters of water. And what you see is just a big pile of mud. You know, the abyssal plain of the, the Juan de Fuca plate is fairly flat, lumpy, sedimentary surface. And then you run into... Uh, essentially a mountain range, but very low, low subdued topography. And that's, that's where the plate boundary is, where you meet North America. And so they're converging at about 40 millimeters a year, roughly. And if you could speed up time, you would see sediment piling up on the North American plate. It's sort of uh, a little bit like a snow shovel, just scooping up more and more snow. And uh, the Juan de Fuca plate is the stronger of the two. So as they converge and while they're locked, uh, the North American plate buckles, and it, it just sort of folds up like a, like a spring, essentially. It's, it's rubberier than, than the Juan de Fuca plate. Eventually, it has to give, and the earthquake is when that, that lock plate boundary lets go. North America leaps forward and subsides. Part of it subsides a meter or two along the coast, and the outer part bulges upward as the spring is released, and that's the part that generates the tsunami. Does the Pacific Northwest feel earthquakes often? No, no, that's that's part of the whole enigma of Cascadia is the number of earthquakes that have been recorded well enough to know something about them on the plate boundary. There are actually only six or seven of them. We almost know them on a first name basis. And so all the earthquakes the Pacific Northwest has are on plate boundaries that are peripheral to Cascadia. And the plate boundary itself is almost completely silent. So in some ways it really belies the potential it has to create an enormous disruption. What exactly are you predicting? Although I know that predicting is a taboo <laughs> word. <laughs> it's in very the much, very much so. Yeah. With seismologists, but still, what does it have the potential to do? Well, Cascadia has the potential to have a, an earthquake very similar to what, what happened in Northeast Japan. Everything we know about it comes from geology rather than, well, almost everything we know about it comes from geology rather than seismology. Since there's so few recorded earthquakes, we have to look into the geologic history of the past to see what's happened uh, in the past. And so we've a core group of around uh, 20 or so people working both offshore and working along, uh, along the coast and coastal bays have found 
multiple lines of evidence all pointing to the same smoking gun of these these magnitude 9 earthquakes. The discovery of this fault, the Cascadia Fault, is a fairly new discovery. And it really was a scientific puzzle that came together on both sides of the Pacific. And one clue was provided by an area called the Ghost Forest. These are (laughs) cedar trees, I believe. And scientists determined that something very strange had happened there. And what did they discover? Yeah, there there are a number of ghost forests along the Cascadia coast, and the first one, actually, when I when I moved up here, uh, I, I found they were quite common and didn't really think anything of them. They're just dead trees. So Brian Atwater had been working around there and found evidence that that these trees were not uh, young trees, not recently killed trees, but were actually killed roughly 300 years ago. And over time, he uh, was able to work the precision of that down to just within a few years of, of the year 1700. But it, it was quite odd to have a, a stand of dead trees that were all roughly killed at the same time and all about 300 years ago. And that was one of the first uh, bits of direct evidence. Well, and they had determined that they had been killed by salt water. That's right. So uh, salt water intrusion was what what killed them. And at first, you know, it wasn't completely clear that an earthquake was really required to do that. But when combined with evidence of the tsunami sand sheet that Brian found and the subsidence of the coast, which is actually what killed the trees, they were growing in a forest near the edge of the estuary. And during the earthquake, the land subsided a meter or so, and suddenly the trees were at uh, were being uh, invaded by salt water at, at high tide. And that's what actually killed the trees. What is a tsunami sand sheet? So uh, along with the, the dead trees uh, that Brian found, there was a, a sand layer associated with that. It was a sand sheet that uh, was thickest at the beach and thin landward, so it apparently came from the ocean and brought uh, marine fossils uh, a great distance inland. So pretty quickly they were recognized as evidence of tsunami. For this detective story, there was corroborating evidence on the other side of the Pacific in Japan. And there was a unique historic record there because... The Japanese had kept records in particular of earthquake and tsunami that went back 1,400 years? Yeah, that's right. That's right. And so the Japanese, above uh, all else, had uh, a society that was, uh, you know, well-developed by that time, you know, a 1,000 years ago, and they had long records. And so 1,700 was not that long ago for them. Careful reading of the older records revealed this, this tsunami that arrived in Japan in the year 1,700, and their society was, was well enough developed that they recorded the water level height at a number of coastal sites around Japan. And the main reason for this was really to get paid back by the shogun for the rice that was damaged in, in coastal warehouses. So they measured this very carefully, probably not exaggerating the way we do uh, today with insurance claims. And uh, Kenji Satake, a, a Japanese colleague, was able to estimate that the source of the tsunami was unlikely to be Uh, any of the other subduction zones in the Pacific, and it was most likely to have come from Cascadia. So where the story is at this point is, in Washington, scientists suspect that there was a massive earthquake and a tsunami followed. But they needed more evidence that this is indeed what had occurred along the Cascadia Fault Zone. They found it in Japan, where records have shown there had been a massive tsunami. Now, Chris, how did they determine then that it was a magnitude 9? Is that what they determined of the 1700 earthquake slash tsunami? Yeah, that's the that's the current estimate, and mostly that comes from uh, modeling the tsunami of the outgoing wave and matching its arrival in, in Japan. So uh, tsunami models, to be honest, are notoriously poor at doing that, so the, the magnitude estimate is, I would consider, a, a bit loose. Uh, but nevertheless, um, the, uh, the arrival of the wave in Japan and, and the water heights can be matched to a surface area rupture of Cascadia that that matches a nine pretty well. Are the areas on the Pacific Northwest coast that are vulnerable to the tsunami uh, the same areas that are vulnerable to the earthquake, or does one have a larger path of destruction? Well, yeah, they're quite. They would be quite different. So the the areas that are vulnerable to the tsunami are going to be low lying areas, uh, mostly where the tsunami can sweep sweep inland. And uh, areas that are vulnerable to the earthquake uh, are going to be areas that are generally in sedimentary basins of some sort along the coast, uh, valleys. And so there would actually be a fair amount of, of overlap, but they're a little bit different. 
Now, your office is in Oregon at Oregon State University, right? That's right, yeah. May I ask, are you in the in the path of this potential destruction? Well, f- not from the tsunami, because we're well inland, but, but the earthquake, yes. Or- Oregon State is uh, typical of a of institutions around here, and our buildings are typical of buildings in the Northwest where we have uh, a very high percentage of unreinforced masonry buildings, and only only three or four buildings on campus have ever been uh, retrofitted, and the rest are are definitely collapse hazards uh, in the earthquake, including my my building. This story has received a lot of attention, especially since the article, the excellent article that appeared in in the New Yorker, and. You've been asked to talk about this threat, this the Cascadia fault line, and I'm wondering how you've approached that because you need to tell the truth about the potential danger, but you also need to not panic people, but I'm wondering if the latter just can't be avoided. How have you talked about it, and what has the reception been for the people that you've talked to in the Pacific Northwest? Well, that's a yeah, that's a good question. It's it's hard to it's hard to convey the sort of enormity of one of these earthquakes in a way that doesn't panic some some of the people. And so, you know, I try to just give it the unvarnished version, uh, much as Catherine Schultz did. She was the journalist she who, was who the, wrote the story in the New Yorker. Yes, that's yeah. right. That's right. And so, um, you know, a given group of people reading the same information, some will be, some will feel panicked, some will feel that it's overhyped or, or whatever we're used to having things thrown at us with lots of hype all the time in, in, in the modern world. But that but the article really painted an accurate picture of uh, what lies ahead. And I think I just think the best way to deal with that is just just deal with reality and um, and realize that we we have you know, without panic, we do have a daunting task ahead to try to prepare for something like this. You were able to determine the probability that this massive earthquake could strike the Cascadia Fault Zone by establishing the pattern of massive quakes on on this fault. And you determined that there was one, and scientists determined that there was one, magnitude 9, in 1700. Are you able to determine when the next one will be? Well, uh, no. We can't. That's something we can't do. But what we can do, the best thing we can do, really, is look further into the past and look at the patterns over time. So the what I do is called paleoseismology, the same thing that uh, that Brian did in Willapa Bay. And the farther back in time we can go, the better our our forecast. And and this is forecast, not prediction. So in the work I do, we work uh, offshore, uh, looking at submarine landslides that were that were triggered by earthquakes. And that record goes back uh, roughly 10,000 years, a little different in different places. But So we have a rich data set, and we can go back and just calculate the probabilities of, of the fault failing from actual data without relying on a, on a model or, a, or very many, or really any assumptions at all. And that's where the one in three number uh, comes from. And so that's, uh, that's a one in three chance uh, in the next 50 years that we'll have anything bigger than an eight anywhere in Cascadia and based on the 10,000 year record. So one in three chance that you'll have a massive earthquake in the next 50 years, you said? Right. right. And that that really pushes it into territory where this might actually happen in our lifetimes and there's a good probability that it will. And that, that sort of really kicked the thinking about this into a different gear altogether. Chris Goldfinger, thank you so much for speaking with us. Thank you very much for having me on. Chris Goldfinger is a marine geologist, geophysicist, and paleoseismologist at Oregon State University. Well, what he had to say is certainly sobering, and I'm saying that here in California, which, after all, is is riven with faults. But there's no doubt about it. There are still secrets under the ocean. Water is, after all, it's just a great cloak. Sunlight doesn't get down there. There's suspended material in the water, so even if you go down underneath with lights, you don't see far. And radar and radio, they, they just don't work underwater. It reminds me of what Carl Sagan said in a different context years ago. Somewhere, something is waiting to be known. Well, that somewhere is probably under the surface of the ocean. Thanks to the deep thinkers who helped produce this show, Gary Niederhoff and Barbara Vance. Also thanks to financial support from Rena Scholsky-David and Sammy David, 
Big Picture Science is produced at the SETI Institute, where scientists study the origin and nature of life. And a big thanks also to our listeners. Your ears have been attuned to what lies beneath. If you'd like to hear more Big Picture Science, you'll find more. The episodes are in our archive at bigpicturescience.org. And if you're a podcast listener, but you prefer listening to over-the-air radio, despite the fact that radio waves don't penetrate the ocean water very far, check out the listing on our website of radio stations that carry the program. And if your local station is not on that list, consider letting them know you like the show. And do you have a comment, a criticism, or a suggestion? Well, toss in some faint praise and then email it all to bigpicturescience at seti.org. 